Hey Ultra family, Justin Tu here, your host today of the Ultra Cycling Show. Thanks for joining us for another sprint round race report. It's a very special one, this time it's with the one and only Leia Goldstein, our 2021 Race Across America champion. Leia claimed first place overall in the world's most difficult ultra cycling event in spite of the record heat and grueling conditions. Out of the 12 Ram Solo races who started the race this year, only 3 finished, including Leia. With a total time of 11 days, 3 hours and 3 minutes, Leia completed the 3037.80 miles across America, about 16 hours faster than the second place finisher. Let's roll. All right, thanks for joining me on the show today, Leia. An amazing job with Race Across America 2021. You are the champion. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm feeling pretty good, recovered pretty fast. So yeah, all is good. And again, thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, I'm so excited to be able to hear just a tidbit about the over 3,000 miles that you race. Definitely can't cover it in the sprint round, but at least we get some kind of race support. And I look forward to Christoph Strasser, of course, Ram champion himself, interview you in even more detail to learn about your motivations, how you got started, what just, you know, has allowed you to become this race across America champion, which is a huge deal. And we're all looking forward to that interview. But before then, I'd love to get us started with this sprint round race report. So it's a fun series of interesting questions where you'll be challenged, Leia, to answer each one within a set time limit ranging from 15 seconds to 60 seconds. But don't worry, Leia, you won't be disqualified for going home. <laughs> so let's go. Okay. First <laughs> question. Tell us who you are in a nutshell, your full name, your age, your location, and your occupation. Well, my name is Leah Goldstein. I'm 52 and I live in Vernon, British Columbia, Canada. And I'm a motivational speaker. I'm with Speakers Canada. Um, and my real job is I do a little bit of real estate on the side. Wow. That's a full schedule. I don't know how you put in training for the race across America. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. So describe the event, the race this year with just one word. I don't know if there is one word, but the only thing that comes to my head, I think, is just epic. <laughs> it's just described. That's the one word that I can think of. Yeah. Well, with 12 people who showed up to the starting line and only three finishers officially, yourself included, that definitely was an epic year of racing. <laughs> okay. Why on earth did you choose to do the world's most difficult ultra endurance cycling event? Why? <laughs> well, I mean, I was a pro racer prior to transitioning to ultra endurance racing. And I remember seeing Ram on television that we used to be on NBC or ABC. I can't remember. And I thought, damn, you know, after I finish pro racing, I'm going to do that. Cause I just like the challenge, you know, um, and the whole dynamics of race across America was something that just intrigued me. And I said, you know, that's my next goal. Wow. Okay. So there's definitely a backstory there. Can't wait to dig further into that and learn about that. That's amazing. Okay. So how did you feel on a scale of one to 10 overall? And then maybe over time as well? Well, I mean, I felt like a million bucks prior to the heat, right? <laughs> but I think just riding in, in those conditions, I mean, I've done ramps two other times before and nothing came close. So it was really, I mean, I was talking to Eric too, who was the first male winner. And we just said it was just you know, a race of survival is getting through that heat, which is basically to the finish line. Yeah, it was a hot year of riding for sure. And it's amazing that you endured to that. Even the competitors in the race across the West, many of them also DNF. Yeah, the temp, I mean, I don't know in Fahrenheit, but it was like 50 Celsius, which I think is 115 Fahrenheit, right? So you can imagine having to ride through that, you know, not just the first day, but the first three days. And then it just carried on right to to the finish line. <laughs> yeah, you want to have a chance to kind of cool off. Yeah. You just stay <laughs> and it you know, stays with. 
Okay, so what was your goal going into this? I mean, you ended up the champion. That's your result. But what was your actual goal? Did you have one? Oh, was absolutely. That was not my goal. Like, it, the, I mean, 11 days, it, it was what you could do in those conditions. Like, you know, it was just um, daunting to keep your body cool. You know, a lot of time is wasted with ice socks and dousing yourself with water, you know. Um, so you can think, imagine how many, you know, how your feet, speed is affected with that. So it definitely slowed us down. But that wasn't my goal. It was closer to a 10-day result than 11-day Mm. Yeah, I know. It was so brutal this year, but that's one of the things that you have to expect the unexpected and just adjust your plan. And you did and you made it. Great job, Leia. Okay. Do you have any idea how much time you spent off of the saddle? Um, I'm going to say uh, hmm, not as much as, you know, I thought I would because of the heat. I mean, I rode through a lot of it. I just couldn't ride very fast through it, right? So we were pretty, you know, consistent with keeping the brakes super short, kept my sleep pattern on, on schedule. It was just the speed that really affected my overall result. Hmm. Yeah, most definitely. Okay, so describe the course for us. It's a really long course. Give well, us some <laughs> I, well, I mean, you know, you're, you're going through the desert in the first part, um, you're hitting Colorado. So you got some good climbing in there, which I like, and then you're hitting Kansas, which I don't like, you know, and then of course, the hardest part of the race is the last part, which is the Appalachians, where it's just climb after climb after climb, where I love climbing, but at the end of that, you don't like climbing anymore. So it was, it was epic for sure. <laughs> and you made it all the way. Incredible. That doesn't bless this, that short little recap. I mean, the conditions, you, you, you won't know until you're out there for yourself experiencing them as a cyclist, how hot it is, all the bugs, insects, wild dogs, all kinds of stuff that you would not be aware of. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, it's ram. It's a different animal every year, right? So you have to expect everything and be just be prepared for it you know what can I what can I say all riders know that right it's probably never going to be what you're hoping it's going to be yeah most definitely it's such a long race as well okay so Leah what time did you start for those who don't know it is a staggered start each solo racer starts at a certain interval do you remember what time you started yes I do I started a little bit later than I was expected to it's like 1 48 like close to two o'clock so like, I think like three hours later than what I started in 2019. Ah, see, interesting. Yeah. Kind of a late start, really hot in the day. Yeah. Hot by the time you get to Borrego and the start of the desert. Do you have an idea of what your average power was? It's some portions over the whole race. Do you know what your maximum power was? Honestly, I don't use a watt device. You know, um, I go based more on um, my heart rate, my, my speed, you know, um, and cadence, right? I kind of, I'm kind of old school in regards to that, right? I go more on how I feel. Sometimes when you look at numbers, it can be distracting. So I know how hard I'm going. I know how hard I can go. And if I'm not going fast enough, right? And also if you're also too attached to something, to a device, you know, if it malfunctions, you, you kind of malfunction. So I'd rather just go based on feel um, opposed to looking at numbers. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I think a lot of us can share that sentiment. And you have many years of experience, especially as a pro racer. So you definitely know your body. Now, do you have any idea about your average speed and max? I know it is on the Ram results page. I can't remember exactly what it was. I think the average um, in Mazi was 11.4, I believe. I'm not exactly sure. And my maximum speed, that would probably be descending. I mean, I don't know in miles, but in kilometers, it was close to 80K. So it, you have to do the translation for me. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah, I'll have to uh, do a calculation on yeah. that. And one will have to, because I can't remember off the top of my head. I know 100K would be about 60 miles per hour. Yeah, I'm not a super daredevil. I've had my fair share of crashes, as you know, in my past. So I'm a little bit conservative on the descending. <laughs> yeah, well... At that speed, uh, that doesn't sound too conservative yeah. to me. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about cadence then, what was your average cadence? And what is your max typically, or what was your max in this race? Well, I, I, I do focus on cadence when I train. So I like to keep it between 85 um, to 90, you know, um, and when I'm climbing about, you know, 65 to 80. 
depending if I'm standing up. My maximum cadence, uh, I don't know, probably 120. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, definitely. 85 to 90. That's a nice sweet spot. I, I like that range as yeah. well. Very cool. Sharing. Okay, heart rate. You were talking about that. What was your average heart rate? And do you know what your max is? Well, actually, I was tested in, in Wingate, the Institute of Sport in the Middle East, that I actually had the lowest recorded heart rate for a female. And it, it was 30, you know, so now my resting heart rate is about 33, because I'm a little bit older. So that's incredibly low. My average for when I'm racing is about 125 to 130 sometimes. And yeah, maximum is not very high, 145, 150. Right. Yeah, very fascinating. I think the lowest uh, resting heart rate I've ever had was about 37 or 38. So yours is really low. <laughs> Pretty darn low, yeah. <laughs> so how many calories did you end up burning? And A lot. Eating? <laughs> Well, I mean, you, I mean, you, you you look at your weight when you start Ram, and then you wait at the end of Ram, right? Like in 2019, I think I dropped like 15 pounds, right? You know, so you can see the deprivation of. I mean, it's hard to say how much you know calories you're burning, but it's definitely a lot. I mean, this year I I dropped 12 pounds, so you know, and then through the heat, it's really hard to eat, you know. So you're eating even less than what you should be. Mm, yeah, and I saw some racers did have issues with that along the way through the desert, many issues that can arise in that heat. Oh, yeah. It's one of those things, have the experience of that heat. You just don't know in your training what it's really going to be like and then how to recover from that. Absolutely. It can be very Okay. How many toilet breaks did you take? Do you, did you have a right kind of cadence that your body get into, or do you have some sense of that? <laughs> uh, it's funny because, you know, with the amount I was drinking, you'd think that I would go to the bathroom quite often, but it, it wasn't like, I think my body was just sucking it all in. Right. So I'm going to say maybe two or three times a day, maybe if that, but it all changes. Right. You know, thanks for sharing. Okay. How many sleep breaks did you take? What was your general sleep strategy? So we started around the first 40 hours, no sleep. And then we started my sleep cycle. So the first one was a three hour. We did that um, then 24 hours. So every 24 hours after my first break, we went down for three hours. Then the last um, three or four days, we went down to 90 minutes. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Very solid, precise plan. I think I did read something about that. Uh, it ended up being a better for your, your sleep cycle, right? Yeah. That I mean, really... I think just being sleep deprived too early in the race, it affects your performance, right? So we were trying to, you know, deprive me more at the end of the race opposed to the beginning. Yeah. Sounds kind of insane though. Like you're so tired at the end yet you're getting even more less yeah, sleep. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's not that much fun at the end. <laughs> Okay. So how did your speed and power profile kind of look like throughout the event? Give us some sense, like along the route that you described earlier, what did it kind of look like? Like in the heat, I'm sure it was a bit slower and how did it progress? Um, you know, obviously when it was in the peak of the heat, it was, you know, it was not as fast as we were hoping for. And then in Kansas, you know, I had a headwind for like 20 hours, right. It was insane where she didn't experience that before. So you know, it was, the challenge was the mother nature. She wasn't on, she wasn't friendly with me this time. Right. You know? Um, yeah. So that takes a lot out of you. And then of course, at the end, when you're climbing the Appalachians, it's whatever you got left in the tank, but you know, climbing is my thing. So I think I was pretty consistent going through the last part of the race. Oh, that's great. Really a uh, great asset to be a climber or a cyclist that likes climbing. Yes. That makes a big, in other words, it's quite a drag there then. Yeah. Okay. So which bicycles did you use for this event? I use, um, well, KHS is an awesome, my awesome bike sponsor who is very generous to me. I've got four bikes. I got um, a time trial bike, a spare time trial bike, exactly the same, a road bike and uh, my spare road bike. So KHS is my main sponsor for bike. Awesome, awesome bike. Love it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Sounds like a really nice setup. Glad you had a good setup for such a grueling event. Yes. Okay. <laughs> What's a bit about your gearing? What gearing did you use on these bikes? Well, I use compact cranks um, just because of the climbing and my gear combination is about uh, 3011, something like that. Um, so I've always used kind of the same gearing, even when I was pro racing, that kind of worked for me. So you're not switching in and out of the big ring too often. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very thoughtful. Otherwise, even all that gear shifting 
uh, takes a toll after a while. Exactly. And also the chance of your chain dropping if you're constantly going into the big, small ring, right? So you just keep it in the big ring when you can. Mm. Yeah, good tip. We should all take that away. That'll help someone. Okay, so how about your tires? What size do you like uh, using and what tire pressure do you like running them at? I like to use 28s. I mean, some of my bike, um, they don't have the space for 28, so we'll use a 25 just because, you know, the jarring of the road and stuff, having a, a, a fatter, wider tire, re, you know, relieve some of that pressure. And I'm usually about, because I'm not a super heavy rider, um, pressure about uh, between 85 to 100 tire pressure, depending on the conditions. Nice. Yeah, sounds like a good standard setup. Cool. Yeah, it's so bumpy, some of those roads or probably most of the roads All out the road. there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's insane. Like when we're training, like nearby in the neighborhood at home and everything, I mean, they're really nice slip paved exactly, roads. Exactly, yeah. Well, Originally, you'll get kind of a bumpy road, but compared to what's out there and Ram, it doesn't yeah. compare. No kidding, yeah. You need a, like a mountain bike <laughs> for some of those roads. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if anybody has brought one out. Or even so the cross bike, right? Like, you know, just with the wider tires, right? I, I would, certain sections, I would have happily jumped on my cross bike. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, so how many sets of clothing did you use? What was your strategy around that? Um, well, my clothing sponsor is Pactimo. Um, and again, he's... Peter, the, the, um, the rep there has been with me for like over 10 years. So, I mean, changing shorts as often as possible and, you know, keeping fresh and having a lot. So you're not ever deprived. You have to wear something stinky. Right. So we had a lot of clothing. We were super prepared for that one. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. It can be something that we, we take for granted going into a race like this and not having, if you've never experienced like a really long multi-day event, you, you might think, Oh, it's okay. It's just like any training ride I do. I'm in the same bibs for 300 miles, maybe yeah. even 500. It really makes a difference. Oh, absolutely. For, and if it starts raining and you're, you know, you don't want to sit in wet clothing, so you better have a lot of changes, right? You never know what you're going to get. It's good to be prepared. Yeah, sounds like you were. So that's great. So tell us about what your overall race strategy was. So you went in, you had a certain goal. And as things unfolded, the heat, everyone dropping out like flies. What, what how did everything evolve for you? Well, our race strategy went to hell because of the heat, right? I mean, it was just hard to maintain the speed that I wanted to, right? And I think that's why I recovered so fast because, you know, muscular wise, I couldn't really push as hard as I really wanted to, right? You know, um, and it was just as I I was saying earlier that I was talking to Eric, it was just like survival of this heat, right? So, you know, you're going as hard as you can without wanting to over, you know, overheat yourself, right? Or to push yourself too much. Cause you know, riding in, in temperatures, you know, that are, it's over 30 Celsius or over 40 Celsius, it's a completely different ball game. So our strategy was not to get heat stroke and get to that finish line. <laughs> that was the strategy that completely changed from when we were at the start line. Right. Yeah. And so true. Well said. I think that is the strategy that everyone had to adopt. Oh my God. Race. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> what did you use for your nutrition? You kind of touched on it earlier. What snacks do you like eating the food? What kind of hydration? Well, I'm, I have a hard time eating in the heat and when I'm you know, pushing really hard, I can't do any solids. So we basically stuck to about 70% liquids to 30% solids, right? So Hammer is my sponsor, food sponsor is mostly, you know, heat perpetuum. And I use those little, you know, insure boostings that old people like to use. <laughs> so I used a lot of that in smoothies, really. And then um, I'm, I'm plant based, I don't eat meat. So we use a lot of vegetarian wraps and, you know, fruit, stuff like that, just kept it clean, simple. Um, that's how I basically eat at home. I'm a very simple eater. So th that was, that was a good part. No issues there. Yeah. We share that in common. Definitely love plant-based meals. Yes. That's really yeah, tell us about your smoothies. What's your favorite flavor or flavors? <laughs> oh, it's a variety, blueberry and banana, you know, mango, orange. Yeah. They just gave me a, a boatload. They just bought the pre, I think they're called naked smoothies or something like that. I'm not sure the name exactly. Um, and they, when they had um, access to use a blender, they would make me, you know, blended drinks and stuff like that, but it's primarily just fruit. That's it. Nothing else. Yeah, Definitely. Well, I enjoy those too. And I remember drinking a lot of those smoothies and insurers across America myself. Yes. Definitely helped. Like you said, 
hard to stomach anything or even try to chew something yeah. and get it down. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure there's a lot more to be said about your crew, but just give us some sense of who was your support crew. Well, my crew has, I use the same people that I have in the past, the first rem, the second rem. I think it's just a couple of new ones, you know. I mean, my crew chief has been with me through almost all the ultra races that I've done. So they all know me really well, you know, which is a huge asset. Um, they all have their own skills. They have a kinesiologist, a massage therapist. Um, I had an RMT, a nurse, you know, a bike mechanic. So they all come with a certain, you know, a specific skill, which is a huge asset. Um, yeah. And like I said, it wasn't, I won is we won the race, right? So I had a great crew, you know, you're not going very far. <laughs> you know? Awesome. Definitely have that team dialed in. That's so cool. And it's great that you've had the same ones through the years. All that experience definitely compounds. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, so tell us about what the most difficult segment was for you. I imagine maybe the heat. Yeah, so I'm going to tell you this because actually I felt really good. Like I prepped for this RAM for, you know, I had two years because of the COVID year. You know, I just kept training like I still was going to race RAM. So I had an extra year of conditioning plus, you know, this year um, to come into 2022. So I felt the strongest I've ever felt. However, like you said, it was just the heat. I've, you know, I've never experienced anything like that. And especially for that duration. So I think that's the one thing that kind of, you know, threw me off a bit was going through those temperatures. Yeah. It's insane. Just watching online and watching the dots uh, definitely didn't even come close to knowing what was happening out there. Yeah. The only that I had of how brutal it was, was seeing all the DNFs showing up. Yeah. Oh yeah. And how slowly the dots were moving probably. <laughs> I mean, like we're walking our bikes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How, what was the most boring segment for you? Is it always the same through all your rams, or was there a particular one this time around? I don't think you have time to get bored. <laughs> you're too tired, right? You know, your brain is a potato. I know. Um, no, there is no boring. It's always, there's always something to think about, to do, you know, your challenges, your, you know, your mind's going at a hundred miles an hour, even when you're sleep deprived. So, I mean, if you do find it boring, then maybe you shouldn't do Ram. <laughs> it shouldn't be boring. It, should, it just should be difficult. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. Well said. Should just be difficult. Definitely. Okay, how about the most enjoyable segment? Was there any portion of the race this year that you really just enjoyed the scenery, just the time, how you felt? I enjoyed the finish. That was also coming in. And I mean, just seeing the crowd there was, I was, I didn't even know that crowd was for me. I thought, you know, I was going turning to my crew and I said, you know, why are all these people here, right? You know, so that was pretty yeah. spectacular. Um, but honestly, I enjoy as crazy as this may seem, and even though we suffer, I enjoy everything about Ram. I just love the challenge. And to me, it's, it's fun. And I would definitely do it again. And I probably will. <laughs> oh, that, that's great. We all look forward to seeing you out there again. Thank you. So what kept you motivated through the 3000 miles? I mean, it was so difficult in the beginning, unexpected, extreme heat. And then as you were going along, there was hardly anyone else out there, except for a few times. And you guys were really racing out there, which must have been fun. But you were just a sole rider going 3,000 miles across America. Most of the field had already dropped out. What kept you motivated? Well, I mean, I mean, we had the possibility of winning the race, right? So that's a huge motivation, you know. And also, I think just thinking, reflecting back of the training that I did, you know, to prepare for this. So it's definitely, you know, you know, revs up your engine. So it's basically a combination of everything. And of course, my crew, they're, you know, they sacrifice their time for me. So I want to, you know, do something for them. And, and they're tired of sitting in that car. They just want to get to the finish line. So it's everything. It was every, a lot of things that motivated me to, to cross that line. Oh, well, that's great. And I could tell that you're a very joyful person and a very positive person. So I'm sure that helps a lot in your own mind. Okay, so tell us about the other unexpected situations. There was extreme heat, but what else was there? What happened out there on those roads? Um, I think we had, a, uh, oh my goodness, in Durango, somebody had died on the, on the course. Like they got hit, a drunk guy got hit and he passed, right? And so we were detoured, right? That was not a good scene. It was like maybe 10 minutes before we got to that one section. 
Um, the, uh, one, another part of the bridge had blown off or whatever. So we had to detour there. And then in, I think it was just past Utah, there was like a traffic of cows for like 20 minutes, just thousands and thousands of cows crossing the road. Right. I've never seen anything like that before, you know? So like I said, there's always something in Ram and those are the three things that come to mind when I'm thinking about the race. Yeah, what a sight. Wow. <laughs> never, not myself never heard of that happening in a race like this either. So that's, yeah, that, that only happens in a round. It only does. <laughs> okay, Leia, tell us what lessons did you learn from this year's race? You have a lot of experience already as a former pro racer, also having done round before. But what did you learn this year? And what would you change for the next time? Um, I think I was... I wasn't as prepared for, I was prepared actually, because in 2019, we had torrential rain and cold and, you know, um, and hail, and I wasn't preparing for the heat. So I think you have to be prepared for everything, you know, so, and it's good that I got hit with this too. So I think that's the only thing, because in honesty, you know, I took notes from the last three, you know, two rounds that I did prior to this one, and we had it pretty dialed in, you know, so I think it's just the lessons I learned is how to tolerate and tackle those kind of conditions a little bit more prepared and just mentally knowing what that's going to feel like. So that was a huge learning experience for sure. Mm, yeah. Good to be mentally prepared because otherwise it can be shocking to the body and to the mind as we were discussing earlier. Now, as it relates to the heat, what would you do differently about your cooling strategy? Is there anything that you would implement for next time? I mean, we, you know, we did what we could. We had that ice sock around my neck. Um, we used frog skin. And then when we could leapfrog, my crew would jump up in front of me every five to seven minutes with a thing of water, like a bottle of water that I doused myself with. And that basically went on the entire day, especially in the peak time when it was like close to 115 Fahrenheit, like 50 on my, on my, um, on my bright and on my uh, little GPS there, it read 50 to 51 going through certain parts of, you know, of the day in Arizona. So that was disturbing to look at. <laughs> yeah. That's not to look at some of the data sometime. I know I had to change the window just so I didn't see this. I didn't want to know how hot it was. Right. <laughs> it was hot. That's all I needed to know. <laughs> Little things make a difference. Yeah. Okay. So tell me, uh, it's been over a month. How long did it take you to recover? Did you have any injuries, anything still lingering? You know, the, the biggest thing were the burns. I mean, I got burned right through my Jersey in Kansas. You know, I, I got blistered. Um, I, I swelled up because of the heat. My lips got, and I got thrush, you know, that, you know, what babies get. Um, and plus the burn on the lips. So it was mainly, mostly the, the exterior of the body. Like I said, you know, physically, I, you know, I started riding within 10 days after the race, right? Not a hard ride, but I was okay to get back on the bike. And of course, um, the saddle sores, which we all get, you know, it took a little bit longer to recover because of the heat and the condition, the moisture, wetting, you know, dousing yourself, um, you know, that they were a little bit more serious, but, you know, considering what we went through, I, I recovered pretty darn fast and I'm proud of that, <laughs> you know, that I'm actually riding now. So it's, it's awesome. Oh, that's great. No, oh, that's excellent. Yeah. It was one of the things that people don't consider even after you finish crossing the finish line, the pain isn't over yet. <laughs> no, it's the, yeah, it's almost worse. Like you know, the next, the next week for sure. Right. Yeah. But again, it was just the burns really. Like the, it was the skin that took the beating. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, well done. Glad you're nice and recovered. Okay. So what tips do you have as the Ram champion 2021, a veteran racer, veteran at Ram, what tips do you have for those who are interested in participating next year? Or maybe for those who, unfortunately dnf this year any tips that you would give them well i mean if it's your first go and you did dnf i think you gotta you gotta do it again right because you know mentally you'll you'll be more prepared which is a huge asset right of knowing what you're getting into and yeah just don't give up like even like i said even if you you know you finished it over the 12 days right you have to do it at least twice to be content with this race right um you know, and then take notes, take notes and take advice from as many people as you can, right? Because and, and write things down so you don't forget. But I think that's the best advice I can give you. Yeah, great advice, Leah. Love that. Got to do it at least twice. <laughs> at least twice. <laughs>
So, Leia, what on earth is your next event? Do you have something on your calendar? Is your mind swirling all kinds of crazy ideas? Well, you know, I I do feel actually ready to race again. If the problem is, as you know, because of COVID, our Canadian U.S. land borders are closed. So, if it does open, which I'm I'm crossing my fingers, and I'd like to race um, the Silver State in September or the No Country for Old Men in Texas, if possible, and then probably Raw next year. Nice. Wow, that's exciting. A lot of cool things to look forward to. Can't wait to tune in and follow you on the dot map. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so anything else that you'd like to share with the ultra cycling community? Um, I that there's um maybe to look out for a documentary that they they're we you know in the process now of over three years that hopefully will come out in early early next year or probably in the spring. So yeah, look out for that. Wow, definitely looking forward to that. That sounds so exciting. Okay, well, Leia, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show for this race report. It's nice to hear from the champion herself. And it's really nice seeing all the photos along the way and great job that the Ram Media did. But always nice to talk with the racer themselves. Glad you did so well and you were able to exceed, I think, everyone's expectations and even your own. And you're able to celebrate that with your crew Looking forward to seeing you in your next race, Leia. Uh, thank you so much. It was fun to be here. Thanks again for having me. All right, Leia and everyone watching at home, until next episode, keep spinning ultra. <laughs> <laughs>